Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C., and I'm joined today by members of our public health and public safety teams, uh, including Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt, Dr. Chris Rodriguez, and Chief of Metropolitan Police, Robert Conti. Uh, we will begin today by uh, providing an update on the 59th inauguration uh, and then provide a, a brief update on um, our vaccine rollout. Uh, yesterday, of course, uh, was a, a very special day uh, for our republic. Uh, I was honored and proud to represent 712,000 Washingtonians uh, in welcoming our new president and vice president. And I want to thank the many, many people who helped make yesterday such a success, starting uh, with the Biden uh, inaugural planning committee. Uh, they planned what I thought was a very thoughtful, inspirational, and dignified uh, inauguration uh, that both celebrated uh, the fresh start that they bring, um, but also respected the moment. I want to also thank the members of Congress who made the event so special, uh, especially Senator Klobuchar and Blunt, uh, who hosted for um, the Congress. And uh, I especially want to thank them for the care um, that they took uh, in making everyone feel secure. I also want to thank uh, D.C. residents and Americans, all Americans, um, for enjoying uh, the events uh, virtually. And I had the chance to see part of the virtual presentation, uh, which I think respected the traditions, um, but also beautifully highlighted our, our city. Um, so thank you um, to, to all of them. Uh, I also want to thank D.C. residents uh, for enduring the street closures and the intense uh, security measures that we all saw. And I know that we will continue working together to keep our city safe um, but accessible. Uh, and all of the security agencies who uh, had to um, put in place their plans uh, almost a full week earlier than they expected uh, and intensify those plans, I want to say thank you to them. The United States Secret Service, of course, is the lead agency for all national special security events. Uh, uh, the special agent in charge uh, joined us for the um, press presentation before the event, so we want to thank them and the entire service. The Department of Homeland Security, uh, especially uh, their most recent uh, Acting Secretary Pete Gaynor, whom we know well from his leadership at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, we also want to thank um, Pete Gaynor and Marianne Tierney. Um, there are 2,500 police officers who came to D.C. from across the nation. Uh, Chief Conti uh, knows well that every inauguration we put out an assistance call uh, to police departments around the country, and we're grateful uh, to all of them who responded to the call. Um, the federal uh, law enforcement agencies, of course, uh, many of, of which uh, we work with day in and day out in the district, and we want to thank them as well. U.S. Park Police, um, the United States Capitol Police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms uh, as well. I also want to thank our neighbors in Maryland and Virginia for their support uh, and the National Guard, uh, a DC National Guard, especially and all the troops that came in from around the country. Uh, our thanks to you. I also want to say a thank you to our teams in particular uh, who have worked um, over the course of, I think, the better part of a year in uh, helping to plan for the inauguration and also uh, led uh, the pivot that we needed post January 6th to ensure a safe and orderly inauguration. Uh, I wanna thank my entire emergency operations center and joint information center. Um, and I wanna thank the Metropolitan Police Department, DC Fire and EMS, DC Homeland Security, DC Public Works, DC uh, Department of Transportation, the Office of Unified Communications, Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Health, uh, Human Services, um, and all of the DC government workers, uh, our comms team, 
uh, who is helping keep people posted as well. I want to thank you for that. Uh, there are many, many public servants uh, who have been putting in extremely long hours in our COVID response uh, and even more during um, the response and the preparation uh, for this year's inauguration. Uh, I also want to thank the many local restaurants who played a role uh, in reaching out to the visiting troops. Uh, and law enforcement officers. And you can see a full list of those restaurants posted here. Uh, and my ask to DC residents is that you continue to support these restaurants and all of our local restaurants and businesses. This has been a tough week for businesses inside an already tough year. Uh, we also have restaurant week coming up next week, and many restaurants have deals, including takeout deals, uh, and you can learn more by going to ramw.org. So thank you to them, and let's do all that we can as we are able to support our local businesses. Uh, and now that the inauguration is over, uh, the work of the new administration is just beginning. Uh, we, you have seen road openings um, already beginning uh, in, in the areas around the, the mall uh, and downtown that were closed. Uh, yesterday evening, crews began removing barriers and fencing on major streets and opening garages that were blocked. The process, we're told, will take approximately 36 hours, so we do continue to appreciate your patience. Uh, you will recall uh, that we put in place a holiday pause on phase two activities related to our COVID restrictions. We extended that holiday pause, if you will, to be an inaugural pause. Uh, and that pause um, we will end on um, Friday, January the 22nd at 5 a.m. Uh, and that means that restaurants can allow indoor dining as long as capacity does not exceed 25%. Um, further guidance is also on the other paused activities is forthcoming. There are several um, government activities that are included there. Uh, also, let me mention a little about um, vaccine, uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, and let me just say that we look forward to working with the Biden administration to figure out uh, how we can get more doses of vaccine to the people of Washington. Uh, the president will be sharing more information about his COVID response plan this afternoon, and we are eager to learn more. We know that demand in, in D.C. is very high. Uh, we know, too, from our sister cities around um, the country uh, that they, too, are experience, experiencing high um, demand for the vaccine. Uh, in a scarcity of vaccine. So we will continue to advocate for more doses so that we can protect um, more people in Washington more quickly. For example, uh, let me just give you um, some numbers and we're happy to take questions about it later. As of January the 16th, DC had received 62,200 doses. We administered over 41,000 doses, and we have uh, had 6,500 additional doses um, becoming available this week. Uh, and there are the distribution or the administration of those doses are in various stages of um, scheduling uh, and people going in uh, to make their appointments. The numbers make it clear that we're getting uh, the doses out. Uh, our systems to get them uh, are working, uh, but we simply don't have enough vaccine to meet the demand uh, in our city. Um, we also have a detailed plan to continue being able to do so, and you can see from this chart, for example, um, what we expect for next week. Uh, this number changes, and we often don't know exactly what the number is until midweek. So you can see we will receive over 8,700 doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 5,600 doses of the Moderna vaccine. Um, we've explained here that those um, vaccines have different storage requirements, uh, which um, lead to how DC Health 
uh, apportions them and recommends their use. Uh, so you can see the breakdown of how the Moderna doses will be uh, delivered this week. The 2,900, almost 3,000 doses will be available through the Vaccinate DC website um, for DC residents over the age of 65 or healthcare workers to make uh, appointments. And then you can see some uh, other uh, other ways that the vaccine is being uh, distributed, including uh, to help vaccinate DC residents who live in intermediate care facilities or community residential uh, group homes, DC residents who are experiencing homelessness uh, as well. You also see the various hospitals that will receive additional doses of vaccine, uh, some to help vaccinate uh, a, a priority group uh, and others uh, to support um, their, their patients. Uh, Dr. Nesbitt will say a little bit more about a, uh, a partnership with Sibley Johns Hopkins to vaccinate uh, at senior housing um, facilities. Uh, and this is a new initiative that we will start uh, this week. Going forward, uh, we intend uh, to release appointments on Thursday at 9 a.m. to eligible residents in priority zip codes and Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, to residents in all zip codes. And that's the uh, 3,000 appointments, for example, approximately 3,000 appointments um, that affect next week. Uh, we've listed the priority zip codes here, which largely cover um, which largely cover wards one, four, five, seven, uh, and eight. Uh, next week, DC Health is also rolling out an initiative that will target seniors, as I mentioned, in DC Housing Authority property. So Dr. Nesbitt, if you would say a little bit more. Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, you all will recall that we've talked um, at length about the way that we establish our phases and our tiers within our phases. Uh, primarily focusing on those individuals who have the highest risk of uh, uh, severe illness and death based on a couple of factors. Our rollout of individuals who are over the age of 65 was one of them. And then also focusing on individuals who are of what is commonly referred to as essential workers. And the reason why we uh, prioritize them is because they help us to prefer, preserve our societal functions. Um, part of what we know is that outside of our long traditional, what has been traditionally uh, referred to as long-term care facilities or our assisted living uh, residences and skilled nursing facilities, uh, we have other places where people who are uh, typically seniors or people over the age of 65 live. Uh, some of them uh, include our intermediate care facilities or uh, community residential facilities. Uh, um, or group homes. Uh, they're not always people who are over 65, but they may have other uh, unique needs and challenges. And we talked often about that vulnerable population here when we were presenting our COVID data uh, to you all in terms of who was having a disproportionate burden of disease uh, and death. And many of them are supported by our Department of Disability Services and our Department of Behavioral Health. And as the mayor previously highlighted, we are, have dedicated doses of the vaccine uh, and partnerships to, uh, with healthcare providers to be able to initiate vaccination with them uh, next week. And that was critically important for us. And you'll recall when you refer to your phases and tiers uh, that that's part of our congregate setting initiative, along with our commitment to ensuring that individuals experiencing homelessness in the district who've also been at increased risk for acquiring the infection uh, will be able to receive vaccines voluntarily. Another group are seniors who live in uh, public housing that are dedicated to seniors. We've identified 14 properties in the district across the District of Columbia uh, where seniors who live in these communities may face unique challenges with accessing the vaccine in community settings that we've identified. Uh, the community settings that we have identified, the pharmacies, the senior centers, the rec centers, and even our health care providers such as our federally qualified health centers that have provided care to these seniors for a long time and have a huge commitment uh, to providing care in the safety net 
also comment that some of these seniors who live in these housing communities may have transportation challenges or even with the transportation network that is put together for them, the seniors may be a little reluctant to schedule appointments at these sites because of the coordination that is required for scheduling their transport. So we've identified these 14 properties that have um, 100 or 200 uh, seniors who live in them and have partnered with uh, Sibley John Hopkins to administer the vaccine to them on, their, in, uh, on the properties. And that initiative will begin uh, next week. So we're very excited about these two opportunities to vaccinate more people uh, who are in phase 1B tier, uh, tier 1. Uh, and uh, we're very excited again about that. Uh, so you'll note that even with our limited supply of vaccine that we're receiving, that's simply not enough to meet demand. Uh, we've been able to dedicate doses of vaccine uh, in the coming week uh, to these critically important efforts. Thank you, Madam Thank Mayor. you, Dr. Nesbitt. Um, and let me just say uh, one, uh, a couple more things about the vaccine and then we will move on. Um, and this week, it, we also announced a, another group of DC employees uh, to be vaccinated. Um, and this actually tracks with um, the Department of Health's uh, earlier announced targeting uh, date. So there's going to meet that um, in-person staff, including teachers and support staff for DC public schools and DC public charter schools. Um, and so e each of those employees, eligible employees will get an email from um, their organization. DC Health and DCPS is partnering with Children's uh, to vaccinate DCPS staff. Um, eligible staff members, as I mentioned, will receive a direct um, communication. Uh, similarly, DC public charter schools will receive guidance from the Office of the State Superintendent of Education regarding um, the charter school vaccination program also starting next week. We've had a few uh, inquiries about child care workers as well. Um, and the truth is if we had more vaccine, uh, we would they would be included in next week's round two. Uh, but the reality is uh, we're working uh, as a fast as we can with the uh, with the vaccine that's available. Our plan is still to prioritize child care workers uh, and get them out uh, just as soon as possible. You will also remember um, that Dr. Nesbitt explained our current phases and tiers uh, and explain um, that the order is based on um, recommendations that we've received around the prevention of morbidity and mortality and the preservation of societal functions. Uh, in terms of prevention of morbidity and mortality, the first populations um, began receiving the vaccines uh, after her healthcare workers were individuals in nursing homes, then followed by district residents over the age of 65. Uh, and in terms of the preservation of societal functions, the first populations uh, to receive the vaccine were healthcare workers, now followed by public school teachers, and um, next followed by the Metropolitan Police Department uh, and members of the government um, who uh, continue government uh, operations. So that is our update for the week and we will take questions. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor Bowser. Uh, first, I wanted to check with Chief Conti. Is there any update in the death investigation of Officer Sicknick? No, uh, it's still the year. Okay, yeah, no, it, uh, no, no updates, uh, no public updates at, at this point. That remains under investigation. Appreciate the update on barriers coming down in the city. Do you have any updates on when we can expect to see the National Guard leave? Um, we, the National Guard, it will be um, leaving out of the city in a wave, and I'll have Director Rodriguez talk about um, the dates we uh, have requested. Yep. Thank you for the question. Um, the the out of state National Guard will begin uh, going home uh, t today. And um, we have requested, uh, because we do anticipate that there will be another national special security event occurring uh, in the joint session of Congress, um, uh, on behalf of the Metropolitan Police Department, we've made a request 
uh, for uh, continued National Guard support with traffic management and, and, uh, and crowd control through January 30th. Specifics on how, much, how many National Guard that would entail? I'm sorry. Do you have question? numbers? So we had 21,000 in the district for the inauguration for the next special security event that you're talking about. Do you know how many National Guard will be present? Um, well, that, those numbers are being worked out right now. So we have to work with the uh, U.S. Secret Service for any national special security event is the lead federal agency for determining, determining those numbers. Okay, thank you. And uh, there's some reports, Mayor Bowser, that the field of flags has started to come down. Can you confirm when the field of flags and pillars of light displays will be removed? Uh, how long will that take and will there be an opportunity for the public to take a look? Um, unfortunately, I, I think that the, the Presidential Inauguration Committee and the National Park Service had an agreement of when they would come down. So I don't know that they will be up on through the weekend. They're expected to come down sometime this weekend? No, I think they're expected to come down before that. Um, it would be my hope that they leave it up this weekend, but I, I, that may be too late. Okay, and it wouldn't be accessible to the public at that point? What? If it's good down, how would, how would it be accessible to the public? Well, I guess before it, it won't be accessible to the public any time before it comes down. I just want to get clarification. I don't know if they started to take it down today or not. Okay. If, it, if it's coming down today, it would be difficult for the public to assess it. Okay, thank you. And do you have a ballpark estimate as to how much uh, erecting the fences across the city that we saw for the inauguration costs uh, and how much it will cost to take them down once they're all down? I do not know, but that, that will be a question for the Secret Service. Actually, when, when will the fence between Black Lives Matter Plaza and Lafayette Square come down? You talking about around the White House? Yes. I, I don't know, have the answer to that either. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, just to be clear, when you say that, um, oh, sorry, uh, Mark Morales with CNN. Um, when you say that the National Guard won't be leaving until January 30th for crowd control reasons, and, and obviously traffic, but I want to ask more about the crowd control. Do you mean that there's going to, do you guys anticipate any sort of large gatherings? I mean, obviously we're all very concerned about white extremist groups, but are there any groups that are troubling you? Any groups that you anticipate or think might be coming in here that you would need those crowd control measures to be taken? Let, let me be clear um, on and amplify a point Director Rodriguez made. The out-of-state guard, when Michael said they're 21,000 guard, most of those are, are out-of-state guard, and those guard are going back to their states. The D.C. National Guard, um, we are maintaining some guard presence through the 30th. Uh, and we are also evaluating now the rest of the year, the next three weeks, the next six weeks, what um, we think would be um, intelligence from our federal partners that would suggest that, that we need um, more presence. Keeping in mind um, that I've directed Director Rodriguez and his team uh, to begin working with our partners on a um, enhanced posture uh, to deal with the threat of white extremism and any other threat to uh, our city. Is there something, is there a specific threat as to causing why the National Guard would have to be here until the 30th? For the crowd control, wanna, I yeah. mean, I think I answered your yeah. question, but I'll have Chris say it another way. Um, Mark, let's be clear. The, the threat of right-wing uh, extremism is here, right? And we saw it on January 6th. Um, and it will continue to be a persistent and real threat to the District of Columbia and to, um, and to our region as well. And so uh, what the mayor has asked uh, me and my team to do in, in collaboration, of course, with Chief Conti and his team and, and our other public safety agencies is to think about what the short, medium, and long-term posture of the district should be to counter the persistent threats that we face. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Uh, we have already had, uh, through, the, through the mayor's leadership, great interaction with the, with the new administration in helping us to think through and, and to develop new partnerships with the Biden administration in order to make sure that we're putting the proper strategies in place, both at the strategic level and at the tactical level, to make sure that we're keeping our city safe. 
Yes, Stephanie. Um, a, a couple questions on security and things that happened yesterday. Mayor Bowser, for you, um, what was it like to oversee the inauguration play out the way it did, especially knowing the security threats and knowing that you do not have control of all of the security that went on? Well, I, we are very grateful, as I mentioned, to the United States Secret Service, uh, who is responsible for national special security events. Uh, I was pleased that um, our, uh, um, our request um, to make the event safer were met by the federal government um, from starting the special event earlier from expanding the perimeter in, in some cases to making sure that uh, our intelligence briefings, um, um, that everyone was focused on a domestic threat, from having the declaration declared earlier, which, um, will, which in, I think ensured the federal assistance um, that, that we needed. So I, I'm very pleased with that level of cooperation. And as Chris mentioned, uh, we also established very, uh, I think, good contacts in the new administration so that um, we can work in tandem on um, a, a strengthened posture. About the National Guard, um, D.C. National Guard staying through, are you requesting that they continue armed? Um, I don't, I'm not going to necessarily talk about those specifics, um, and that, keep in mind that I think the current request is for a few more days, um, but that's not to suggest that we're not going to need guard assistance for other events. And then also when it comes to future events, um, given what we saw on January 6th, the permit had been increased days before going from, you know, the number it was to 30,000 participants expected. Um, will the city be requesting changes as to what is considered an NSSE event when it comes to public demonstrations, even though it's on federal property and not? Yeah, I doubt that. Um, although, because the, the NSSE is a very specific um, a, a set of events, we will request that any meeting of the, any joint session of Congress would be, in, in my view, should be a special security event. Um, and I, I don't know that there are that many joint sessions of Congress outside of the State of the Union, uh, but certainly the certification of, of votes is, is one. It has been pretty uneventful. I think I've never even seen any focus on, on, on that until this year. So, but I think it, it's very clear to me that any a joint session of Congress should be a special security event or some package like that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mayor. When, uh, I think we've, you've talked about it, but basically when is the D.C. going to look normal again without fences and all that stuff? I mean, today's Thursday. What, what are we talking about? I think for the most part, the kind of restrictions on driving will be um, over by tomorrow morning. A lot of it is down today. So a lot of the major routes and corridors will be down today. Now, we do need the public's assistance on some other aspect of D.C. being normal. Um, and that's all the boards that we see on businesses. Uh, we saw boards before last week. Um, we've, we've seen boards throughout COVID um, and throughout summer protests. Uh, and so part of looking normal uh, is for those boards to come down. I know, Chief, do you want to mention anything else about boards? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, so we are certainly uh, encouraging uh, businesses uh, to, you know, as we break down these, these barriers, these fences, uh, the, the, the cinder block barriers, you know, that we're asking that everyone just join in uh, with us to include the business community in removing uh, you know, some of these boards that have been put up, as the mayor said, you know, the quicker that we get back to uh, some sense of normalcy in our city, I think it will be uh, in the best interest of the overall recovery of our city. Where do you think your boards will, or your barriers will be down? Well, the goal right now, uh, as the mayor uh, mentioned, uh, they started uh, last night coming down, and we're anticipating uh, hopefully by tomorrow morning, by 6 o'clock, everything that we have control over, uh, those barriers will, will be down. Uh, we started working, uh, the, the 
um, deconstruction of these fences. They started working from east to west. So uh, just on the way here, just kind of checked in on the progress as of about 1130. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, all that progress is being made there. All the bridges are open uh, from Virginia and Maryland into the city. The bridges within D.C. Uh, are, 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 all, are all open. So we're just continuing uh, to do the things that we need to do to make sure that our city is open and ready for business. Mayor, uh, I saw a video of you um, sitting there and the president running over to say something. What did he say? What, what was that about? Well, he said, Madam Mayor, and I said, welcome, Mr. President, and, and how glad we were that he was moving into the White House. It wasn't, as you might imagine, a president running along a parade route. It wasn't a long conversation, but it was definitely warm and appreciated. Yes. Follow up on the National Guard request. Uh, if you are doing it because of the upcoming joint session, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. No, but we haven't made a request related to the joint session yet. Well, I thought that's what the director said, that there's an upcoming NSAE event, and that's why you had requested that they stay through January 30th, but that would not, I don't believe, be until sometime in February. Yeah, we haven't, and I don't, um, Chris may have misspoke about the, about the date, but uh, we, we're kind of winding down our National Guard, the D.C. National Guard, through the 30th. And then, so you would, they would leave on the 30th, and then theoretically, if for a joint session in February, they would come back as part of an NSE? SE? Per, again, the United States Secret Service runs the NSSEs, um, and we will work with them, and we will evaluate at the time what, we, what our local needs are. And my last security question, Chief Conti, uh, just to follow up on the death investigation of the officer at the Capitol, can you tell us, has it definitively been ruled a homicide? Do you know cause and manner as of this point? No, it uh, has not been definitively ruled a homicide. And the cause and manner, uh, that will be made by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. I mean, obviously there are uh, several tests uh, that need to be completed. I don't have the, the time frame when the, when the actual cause and manner will be determined, but I would imagine it should be in short order. But it's being investigated. Well, how is it being investigated? So uh, obviously any death in the District of Columbia, uh, the Chief Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, I mean, they take in consideration all the facts uh, surrounding the death. And then doctor, uh, the doctors over there at the medical examiner's office, they, again, they just make the final determination. They'll tell us whether it's natural causes, they'll tell us whether it's homicide, but it really just kind of depends on all the things that took place. In the, uh, in the case of the officer uh, from the U.S. Capitol Police, uh, obviously there's tons of video that's being going, that's, uh, that they're uh, uh, going over, interviews with uh, individuals who encountered uh, that officer uh, while he was there uh, in the Capitol. Look, uh, there was some information out there that the officer got hit with a uh, fire extinguisher. All those things uh, really have to be uh, determined and see where the sequence of events kind of, you know, what ultimately uh, led to his death. Was it, you know, something internal or was it something external that contributed to that? So that, again, that decision is made by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Tom. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Pardon me, I'm gonna take the mask off. About the National Guard, I'm glad that you made a point that the, all the national National Guardsmen from places other than the district are in the process of leaving or preparing to leave. I would ask the, 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 uh, Mr. Rodriguez, how many National Guardsmen who are all volunteers who've been called from their private jobs, how many are still on duty at, as of this moment? I don't have that number off hand, Tom. Is it roughly 2,000 or is it the whole National Guard for the District of Columbia? Well, the whole National Guard for the District of Columbia was activated for the inauguration. Right. Um, and I, I would note, though, that that's not just the request of the city. As the mayor mentioned, the Secret Service runs the NSSC, and the federal government can make requests for the D.C. National Guard. Including the United States right. Capitol. But, but the plan would be for them to go back to their regular mm -hmm. job as soon as possible, but in an orderly way. Right. Yes, okay. of course. Uh, let me ask about the private barriers on public buildings. I know you're requesting that people take them down. Some of these barriers take up public space. Are you talking about when you say barriers? Barriers, the windows boarded, boarded up downtown. Up. Mm -hmm. They have the, bar, the wooden uh, beams that extend out well out into the street and other places. It may sound bureaucratic, but is there some public space issue that if, if they don't voluntarily take them down, you could certainly tell them to take them down because they are violating public space? There may be, there may be. 
Okay, then I have a question for Dr. Nesbitt so she won't feel left out. <laughs> Dr. Nesbitt, you have been cautioning and you have been warning and asking people not to go to big events. And um, you've asked people to avoid big crowds and you yourself have said you haven't even gone to an in a restaurant indoors. The mayor very honored you by taking you to the inauguration yesterday. One, I'd like to ask you your personal feelings about being there and seeing the peaceful transfer of power, but also how did you feel being in such a big crowd and did you wash your hands afterwards? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Tom, never one to shy away mm -hmm. from, a, from the personal question mm -hmm. to Dr. Nesbitt, mm -hmm. who is an introvert. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, I was truly honored uh, to um, accompany Mayor Bowser yesterday to uh, what was absolutely a historic event uh, for our nation, um, which meant a lot to me uh, as a black woman to see our vice president uh, be to take the oath of office. Uh, and um, I was honored to represent the District of Columbia. Uh, I was also um, honored to see so many of the mayor's colleagues, uh, other mayors around the country and other governors um, commend her for her leadership uh, leading the nation's capital uh, through the events over the past few weeks, but also in our response to COVID and how we've navigated the pandemic and how many people commented about um, watching these press conferences and the comments that you all, the questions you all provide to us and what they learned from what we have been able to put in plus, place here. So um, it was a tremendous honor to have, to be a member of her team, to be a member of her cabinet, uh, and to know that the admiration we have for her as, a, at our, as our mayor is admiration that other people have for her. Uh, so it was a, a, a great moment for me in so many different ways uh, that I will reflect on and cherish uh, for years to come. Uh, and uh, we got a lot of TV time. I got a lot of comments about that afterward uh, from, from a lot of my friends uh, around, around the country. Uh, in terms of large events, Tom, you know, I've been a hermit uh, for, uh, for the greater part of probably the past 10 or 11 months in terms of being very judicious because uh, I believe in being a huge role model uh, for our city and for our nation as a public health official uh, in terms of where uh, I will go and what it is that I will do. Uh, I have been a great partner with Dr. Brian Monahan, the, uh, the physician at the Office of the Attending Physician who established the protocols uh, for yesterday's event uh, in partnership with the other leadership for uh, the Presidential Inauguration Committee and the, the, the Joint Congressional Committee uh, for the inaugural ceremonies. Uh, it was a well-planned event. Uh, the public health advisors for the event did an extraordinary and a remarkable job in terms of our screening processes prior to attending the event, uh, our screening processes as we arrived for the event, uh, the seating for the event, uh, our, the thing, a lot of the things that we worry about in public health for uh, large events with ingress and egress uh, were all well attended to. Um, and yes, I did wash my hands. My hands, because of the temperature, remained gloved uh, <laughs> uh, for the entire time. But as soon as we uh, came indoors, I had the opportunity to wash my hands. But um, I do want to say it, it, it was a uh, remarkable event. Um, I think that the circumstances in our country at this time in terms of the transfer of uh, the peaceful transfer of power um, called for, and especially after what happened two weeks ago with the insurrection, calls for us to be able to have something scaled back that was not very large at all, um, for people to be able to witness this, the small number of people who were there, um, that, you know, the certain circumstances were called for our nation to be able to witness this uh, with a small group of people uh, in attendance. And you were there, as the mayor said, to honor all the Healthcare that, workers. that is correct. And, and the response to that, I think, has been, has been remarkable. Uh, and people have been able to show a tremendous amount of pride in what our public health uh, professionals have been through. 
um, in the past several uh, several months in terms of responding to uh, this pandemic, this once in a hundred years uh, pandemic that we're experiencing. Thank you. And Mayor, just one quick bureaucratic question. Jeff Marudian is leaving to join the Biden administration. Uh, DDOT, did you n name an interim or someone yet in charge of that? Did I miss it? Um, the deputy director for DDOT will serve in an interim capacity. Uh, his name is Everett Lott, and we will be posting um, uh, the vacancy for DDOT director, and we certainly um, wish Jeff, uh, who has done a really good job for us at DDOT across all eight wards on some um, very significant priorities for our administration, so we wish him well. All right. Okay, well, let's see, one more swing around. Um, are you ready, Mark? Okay. COVID questions, we can move on to vaccine. And yep, now? absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, two questions on that front. Um, one, uh, your original pause, as you indicated, included many more uh, places and businesses and activities than just restaurants. Can you tell us which ones will be turned back on, which ones will, or which ones will not be turned back on tomorrow? And then I have another question about vaccines. Um, I think that all of the, the I want to get some clarity on the, the government services that have been turned off, um, libraries, the limitations on recs, um, the circulator, those will remain uh, paused. And I think that the only other is museums. Yeah, how about museums and churches and retail? Will they... There was no, they weren't affected by the pause. None of those were affected by the pause. Mm -mm. Museums okay. were, and so let me get back to you with some clarity on that. Okay, and then on, on the rollout of vaccines, you have consistently said that you're not getting enough allocated vaccines, but then we consistently see a, 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 a large percentage of a lag between the vaccines that the district is allocated and how many shots in the arm. And so I, I guess the question is, you know, how can you complain about not getting enough shots, enough vaccines, if you're not administering all the vaccines that you have been allowed? There seems to be- Well, I, I, don't, I don't want you to reduce my comments to complaining um, because, and, it, and, and while we say we need more, everybody needs more, and I recognize that. We're a country of 300 million people, and I think so far 30 million it's growing, but about 30 million vaccines have been produced. Is that still right, Dr. Nesbitt? So, you know, we, we can just see that there is a, there's a big delta there that we have to close. And so this system uh, is that we have to schedule people um, when we have the vaccine, and then they have to make appointments, and then they have to get the vaccine. Uh, and that is the difference that you see. And Dr. Nesbitt told me that we remain um, out of all the jurisdictions administering vaccine. And uh, tell me the phrases yeah, that you will use about how we're doing. We're in the top tier. So uh, our efficiency is, you know, if you're a high performer, you're around 70%, and that's where we are. Um, we still don't have good data coming into our system where we produce these numbers for our long-term care partnership. However, all of the vaccine that's been allocated to that, those vaccine clinics have been scheduled. Um, so those vaccines uh, um, clinics are planned. And the federal government does account for that when they're looking at our efficiency. And it, the, the mayor is exactly right. So when you're looking at that delta mark, that delta is never going to go away. It, it's impossible for it to, it won't go away until the program is over. Uh, because when you look at administered, you have to take into consideration once we give a provider vaccine, and many of them do this rightfully, they don't schedule out weeks in advance because they are doing the same thing we are doing is we're relying on a guarantee that we're actually going to get doses of vaccine from the federal government. And they're relying on a guarantee from us that they're going to get vaccine from us before they commit to a patient that they can come in next Thursday, two Fridays from now, and actually get a shot because they don't want to be put in a position to have having to call you, Mark, and tell you, I'm sorry, I have to cancel you Friday at 3 p.m. because I didn't get any doses of Moderna, right? So uh, what you actually see is a delta between when we actually get the doses, them having to be scheduled, people coming in, and the dose actually being administered. That's one gap. Then there's a reporting requirement of the dose back to us 
in a required mandated system that every jurisdiction who administers or responsible for administering and reporting the vaccine has. When we first started, some of our providers had a lag between putting that dose in somebody's arm and reporting it back to us for as much as seven or 12 days. Now we've gotten that down. Most people are reporting within 72 hours. It should be within a day. But that's why you are never going to see that be an exact one-to-one -one match. It has nothing to do with the doses not actually being administered. It has more to do with scheduling and a data reporting lag. We're, we're, we're almost there with people reporting within 24 hours, but we still got some who are out as far as 72 hours. Some of our providers say that the system that they use just won't help them get there to 24 hours. But I want you to make sure you understand as long as we're at 70%, we're top notch uh, in terms of that administration because of those two factors that play consistently into why once you get a dose, and once you administer it, these other things have to happen. Ongoing question about wastage. Can you give us any data on wastage? Sure. So I, I don't have the data on wastage. Um, it's not in the system where we're pulling other data from. Our data folks are working very hard to try to access other systems to, do, to get it, to pull it from providers. As soon as we have that data, we'll provide it to you all. And we even raised some issues or some questions with a, on a state call with the CDC in terms of better refining any data that they have on wastage uh, so that as we make this data more publicly available, we can contextualize it appropriately uh, so that the reasons for wastage can be very clear as well. Yes, Sam. Uh, Dr. Nesbitt, your second shot. If you got Moderna the first time, do you have to get Moderna the second time or does it matter? Yes, you, you ha you, it is recommended and required that you should get the same d vaccine that you received uh, for first, first dose for second dose. There is no data available on the, the ability to interchange the different types of COVID-19 vaccine that have been approved. So if you began with Moderna, your second dose should be Moderna. If you began with Pfizer, your second dose should be Pfizer. Thank you. Yes, Stephanie. Um, with, I don't know if this, well, Dr. Nesbitt, if you may, um, when the temporary or holiday pause went into effect, that was December 23rd, um, we had a positivity rate of 4.7, daily case rate 31.75. Um, we, uh, you know, understand that Mayor Bowser, you included some of the security reasons for why the temporary pause was extended. Um, but looking at the numbers, a lot of them look to be higher than they are today than they were December 23rd. Can you kind of just go back and, and explain the metrics that we're supposed to be looking at now for increasing or closing dining capacity so that you know these are not arbitrary decisions that are being made? No, they're not arbitrary. Let me let me jump in. We um, there these are all phase two activities and the metrics. Um, I don't know if we have that slide up today where we remain squarely in phase two. Um, we were taking advantage over the holiday uh, to where we know that there is could be more travel and gathering to rec to uh, to recommend less of that with with this pause, uh, and we extended that uh, through the inauguration. And those things are over. And as we indicated, then we'll roll um, off uh, on the paused activity. So, what is the next metric then that we should be looking at to decide whether we're going to go back to closing or phasing again? What you're looking at the the phase one, twos, and threes. What are the numbers? The positivity um, numbers. Do we can numbers? we pull up that chart, guys? Uh, we'll we'll pull up the chart and uh, I'll speak to it in a second. Yes. Uh, so we received a report that CVS had canceled the planned mass vaccination of a senior home this week, uh, and we've gotten other sporadic reports of people who are registering through the DC site, but then hearing from the pharmacy that their appointments were canceled. Can you say what you know about pharmacies canceling appointments, including the CVS and Walgreens program? Yeah, so um, CVS and Walgreens do not, are not affiliated with the portal uh, that is vaccinate.dc.gov. Uh, they are part of the federal long-term care partnership. 
Uh, so they schedule, work directly with uh, um, long-term care facilities, which would be nursing homes and assisted living residences. Uh, so any cancellations of clinics that happen there are a function of the scheduling between that nursing home and the CVS and Walgreens partnership. The DC Health and DC government are not involved in the scheduling of those clinics or any of those things. Was that um, a DC facility? I'm sorry. Was that a DC facility you were referring to? Oh, the home. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not specifically sure. Right. Okay. But so just so, but the, we don't schedule for those. Okay. Uh, thank you. And then the second question, uh, council member Janice Lewis George and several other council members today, uh, wrote a letter to your office, mayor Bowser, uh, asserting that child care workers should be included in next week's vaccination rollout alongside teachers and police officers because they're among the most vulnerable city workers uh, and alleging that child care workers have been deprioritized. You said earlier at this news conference, there's just simply not enough vaccine to meet demand, but uh, I wanted to give you or Dr. Nesbitt the opportunity to respond directly to these members of the council or child care workers who feel slighted. Um, I definitely already spoke about child care workers and how we will continue, uh, they will continue to be uh, in a priority group. Uh, you might also remember when we talked about groups, phases and tiers, that they were always targets. Um, and they were, they were always targets. We knew that they could happen earlier or they can happen later. And that continues to, to be the case given the fluidity of how much vaccine we receive. Thank you. And I got clarification. It is a DC nursing home, uh, Ingleside. Okay. We'll, we'll have to, we'll definitely check up with that and I'll ask the department of health to, um, see what happened with CVS or Walgreens. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask if you guys are working on any type of after action report uh, in regards to the events on January 6th and, and for Chief Conti, are you, is there body camera footage that's available from that day? If so, how much of it are, are you reviewing of that footage and at any point will you be releasing any of it? All of our officers are equipped with uh, body-worn camera footage, and I have reviewed some of it. Uh, we only release uh, body-worn camera footage that's, uh, you know, in, in line with the mayor's order uh, for, for our officers. So uh, I'm sure that in terms of after action, um, you know, we're certainly going to be working on one uh, MPD internally, but I'm sure that uh, just across government, uh, at, even at the federal level with the congressional hearings that are to come, et cetera, that there'll be several after action uh, reports. I think the uh, Congress has, um, uh, uh, they, are have, they have the services of General Honore, I think, that will be doing it at the, at the federal level. So sure, there'll be uh, several after action reports. Will you be doing the, uh, the one for the MPD? Or will, will you guys be having your own, I should say? Yeah, we'll be doing one for MPD, but even at a, at a greater level, I'm sure Director Rodriguez will be looking at just kind of total, total government, DC government, you know, how, you know, where, what, what are the areas uh, that, that we responded to and, you know, where the improvements need to be, et cetera. Okay, thank you, everybody.